Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. On today's video, I want to share with you a couple of secrets about your physical examination procedures that you employ with your injured workers. And the material that I want to share with you today is extracted from a six-hour QME continuing education program entitled the 21 Secrets of the Most Persuasive QMEs. And the, this program, the 21 Secrets, uh, has proven to become our most popular QME continuing education home study program. And since this program was published uh, in 2013, I've received uh, innumerable, innumerable requests from doctors uh, requesting additional elaboration on some of the topics uh, that are discussed in that program. And so that's the purpose of today's video is to expand on a couple of the topics that are extracted from that program. And let me just say a couple of words uh, about the 21 Secrets program before we get into uh, today's material. The 21 Secrets program came about uh, as I started to assemble notes uh, that I had obtained through the interview uh, and discussions with uh, some of the most successful some of the most influential, some of the most well-respected, and some of the most persuasive QMEs in the entire state of California. And over the years, uh, I've had the opportunity to sit with and to interview and to listen to at lectures and seminars uh, some of these most uh, highly influential QMEs. And in each circumstance, I took extensive notes uh, and asked a lot of questions, and I studied uh, this material over the years and I refined the material and I investigated the material and I researched the ideas and I eventually assembled all of these ideas into a program and the program is entitled uh, the 21 secrets of the most persuasive QMEs and that program is divided into four main sections section number one uh, involves the preparation or the preparatory secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. Section number two involves the interview and physical examination secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. Section number three involves the report writing secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. And then finally, section four uh, involves the deposition secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. Well, for those of you that are following this video series, you know that I've already created several videos to fully discuss and elaborate on the preparatory secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. And we're now in the interview and physical examination video series. And this is the fourth video that discusses the interview and physical examination secrets of the most persuasive QMEs. And over time, uh, we'll have additional videos about the report writing secrets and the deposition secrets. But for today, I want to share with you a couple of interview and physical examination secrets uh, that seem to be universally used uh, by some of the most persuasive and uh, most successful QMEs. And today, I want to share with you two ideas. Uh, the first one is entitled, Know the Impairments and examine for them. Know the impairments and examine for them. And th in this topic, uh, we're gonna talk about the different permanent impairments that exist for the spine, uh, for the upper extremity, and for the lower extremity. And we'll use those as uh, three examples to illustrate the principle that you need to know what are the impairments for the spine, what are the impairments for the upper extremity, what are the impairments for the lower extremity as are described in the AMA guides? What are the impairments and how do you examine for the identification or the assessment of those impairments? And what you're going to see, uh, what you're going to discover is something that I discovered myself some years ago and that is that our physical examination procedures for the assessment of permanent impairments is different than our physical examination procedures that we use 
for the assessment of diagnoses or physical conditions. And the reason that the physical examination maneuvers are different is because when we're examining in our clinical practice uh, to identify a diagnosis, we're looking to identify a diagnosis because it's the diagnosis that then drives the treatment protocol. Well, as qualified medical evaluators, we're not rendering treatment. So our physical examination is not directed at establishing uh, what is the diagnosis. Our physical examination procedures are directed at determining and discovering what is the permanent impairment. And therefore, it's the permanent impairments that drive the permanent impairment rating. And so there's a little subtle distinction and a subtle nuance between the physical examination procedures that we do in our clinical practice on this hand and that we do in our medical legal practice on the other hand. Little subtle differences. So the concept is to know the impairments and examine for them. And we'll discuss the different types of impairments uh, that are described in chapters 15, 16, and chapter 17 very briefly here uh, in today's program simply to illustrate uh, this principle. And the second topic that I want to share with you today is entitled uh, perform every single objective test. Perform every single objective test. And we'll talk about the different types of objective physical examination maneuvers and procedures that we use in our physical examination. And I want to leave you with the idea that you are to never ever leave the physical examination procedure with a single physical examination objective test undone. You want to perform every single possible objective test that relates to the physical examination of your examinee. Never ever ever leave the examination with a single test undone and never ever ever uh, try to recreate a physical examination finding uh, that relates to objective physical examination tests. Okay, so those are our two topics for today. Uh, I'd like to ask you now to uh, go ahead and grab your AMA guides because we're going to reference uh, chapters 15, 16, and 17. And I'll draw your attention to uh, specific passages in the AMA guides as we go along. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab my AMA guides. I'll ask you to do the same. And uh, I look forward to being right back with you here uh, in just a moment. and I hope you have yours as well. And what I want to discuss with you now uh, uh, has to deal with your physical examination. And today's topic is to know the impairments and to examine specifically for the presence or absence of those permanent impairments. And you're going to find that this is a little bit different than the physical examination procedures that you use in your clinical practice. So to illustrate this principle, uh, let's turn our attention to chapter 15 of the AMA guides. Chapter 15 is the spine chapter. 
And when we consider the permanent impairments of the spine, let me ask you, uh, what are the permanent impairments that relate to the spine? If I asked you that question, uh, how would you respond to that? What are the permanent impairments that the AMA guides require us to identify in our physical examination for the assignment of a permanent impairment rating? Well, we all know that the AMA guides uh, describe permanent impairments of the spine with two basic systems. We have the DRE, Diagnosis Related Estimate System, and we have the Range of Motion uh, method for determining permanent impairments. So let's focus for this illustration purposes of this topic uh, on the DRE method of assessment for permanent impairments of the spine. So the DRE method describes several physical examination findings that qualify uh, for permanent impairments, that qualify as permanent impairments and qualify for a permanent impairment rating. So what are those physical examination findings? Well, those physical examination findings are described uh, in box 15.1 on page 382 of the AMA guides. And let me just list those for us here uh, quickly and then we'll elaborate on some of those to illustrate uh, today's concept. The physical examination findings that if these examination findings are present at the permanent and stationary date or say when the examinee is at maximum medical improvement, if these physical examination findings are present, they qualify uh, as a permanent impairment. They represent a loss, loss of use, or a derangement of function of the spine. So those physical examination findings include muscle spasm, muscle guarding, uh, asymmetry of spinal motion, uh, alterations of reflexes, uh, weakness or loss of sensation, uh, atrophy, uh, radiculopathy, uh, uh, electrodiagnostic verification of radiculopathy, uh, alteration of motion segment integrity, uh, the presence of cauda equina syndrome, and finally, uh, positive findings on urodynamic tests, which are tests for uh, function of the bladder. So these are some physical examination findings that the AMA guides consider to be important that we assess for. <clears throat> it's important that we assess for the presence or absence of muscle spasm. It's important that we assess for the presence or absence of atrophy. It's important that we assess for the presence or absence of radiculopathy, etc. So the guides describe these physical examination findings. Now, these physical examination findings are different from the physical examination findings that we assess for uh, in our clinical practice. So let me ask you, what are some of the uh, physical examination findings that we assess for in our clinical practice? And what are some of the physical examination maneuvers that we use uh, in our clinical practice? Well, if we're talking about the lumbar spine, and let's just use the lumbar spine uh, as an illustrative example here, uh, when you're examining the lumbar spine, what are some conditions uh, that you typically assess for in your physical examination? Well, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the things that we assess for would be, for example, uh, lumbar sprain strain. We would assess for uh, lumbar facet syndrome. We would assess for sacroiliac uh, dysfunction or subluxation or sacroiliac sprain strain. Uh, we would assess for symptomatic disc bulges or disc herniations. Uh, and various different things that we assess for in our clinical practice which when we identify these conditions, these conditions uh, then drive the treatment protocol. Well, it's interesting because lumbar facet syndrome, 
sacroiliac sprain strain, uh, disc bulging, symptomatic disc bulging. None of those are listed here in the physical examination findings that the AMA guides consider to be important because the AMA guides are concerned with the identification of permanent impairments. They're not concerned with the identification of uh, conditions that require treatment. It's a little subtle distinction there. And so our physical examination maneuvers that we use in our clinical practice uh, are different and distinct from the physical examination maneuvers that the AMA guides require. So let me ask you, uh, since the AMA guides consider that permanent muscle guarding or muscle guarding at the permanent and stationary date, in other words, when the examinee is at maximum medical improvement, if there is muscle guarding present, muscle guarding qualifies as a permanent impairment. So let me ask you this question. What is your physical examination that you use for the identification of the presence or absence of muscle guarding? See, muscle guarding is not something that we typically assess for specifically in our clinical practice, but the AMA guides require that we assess for the presence or absence of muscle guarding. So let me ask you, what physical examinations maneuvers can you use specifically to assess for muscle guarding? What would you say? How would you assess or how would you identify uh, muscle guarding in the lumbar spine or muscle guarding in the thoracic spine or muscle guarding in the cervical spine? It's an interesting question. Correct? Now, I've posed this question to many doctors, and many doctors uh, simply reply that uh, they identify muscle guarding uh, with their palpation exam. And that's a correct answer. That is one way that we identify muscle guarding. But let me ask you, what are some different ways that muscle guarding manifests itself uh, throughout your physical examination? Would muscle guarding manifest itself as pain on range of motion? It could, correct? Correct? In other words, when the examinee goes through various ranges of motion, if they report pain and restriction in the range of motion, what does that restriction do? Well, typically it's due to muscle guarding, correct? So we can identify muscle guarding on our range of motion exam. We can identify it with our palpation exam. We can identify muscle guarding as muscle guarding manifests itself through pain on certain physical examination uh, maneuvers, such as squatting and leg raising and various uh, orthopedic tests and maneuvers that we do. Muscle guarding manifests itself under many faces and guises. And so you need to have a procedure for the identification of one of the important permanent impairments that are described in the AMA guides one of which is muscle guarding. Okay. Uh, to illustrate another example, uh, what are the physical examination maneuvers that you use for the assessment of radiculopathy? You need to have a specific section in your examination entitled the radiculopathy exam because the AMA guides consider the presence of radiculopathy as a permanent impairment. So you need to know the impairments and examine for them. You need to have a specific physical examination uh, protocol for testing weak, for the presence or absence of weakness and loss of sensation. And that's not really brain surgery because that constitutes part of our neurologic exam and we know that. So that's an example that might be typically already uh, a component of our normal physical examination. But muscle guarding is an example that that's something that we don't typically uh, describe in our diagnosis, muscle guarding. So we need to have specific ways to identify uh, the presence of muscle guarding. Um, as another example, uh, the AMA guides describe, uh, as relates to the spine, an alteration of motion segment integrity uh, at the maximum medical improvement date, if there is an alteration of motion segment integrity present at that time, that qualifies 
for permanent impairment. And it's interesting because I found that not many doctors uh, do a formal assessment uh, for the presence or absence of alteration of motion segment integrity. So let me ask you, uh, what procedures do you use for the assessment of motion segment integrity? This needs to be a formal and regular part of your regular procedure uh, in spine cases. Why? Because the AMA guides require it. They require that we assess for the presence or absence of these permanent impairments. And alteration of motion segment integrity is a permanent impairment. It's described right here uh, in box 15.1. So, as we know, the assessment for alteration of motion segment integrity involves uh, an analysis that we perform on flexion extension radiographs uh, of the spine. And I found that not many doctors actually order the flexion and extension radiographs and not many doctors uh, perform the analysis, but it's required uh, in the AMA guides. Now in asking doctors uh, why they don't do this procedure, many doctors will say uh, that they've simply not taken the time uh, to integrate that procedure into their normal evaluation. And the reason that they have not done that is because in our clinical practice, we don't typically assess for alterations of motion segment integrity. Uh, certainly we don't do it in the manner that's described by the AMA guides because the AMA guides are, just, are concerned with very specific situations. They're concerned with the presence or absence of permanent impairments. And in our clinical practice, we're concerned with the presence or absence of various diagnoses. Okay? So there's a subtle distinction there. And so doctors will tell me that they don't do an analysis of uh, motion segment integrity because they're just not uh, set up to do that. Or they haven't set themselves up to do that. Or they haven't integrated that procedure into their protocol yet. But the guides require it. And so the concept I want to share with you today is to know the impairments and to examine specifically for the impairments. And so just as relates to the spine, using the two examples of muscle guarding uh, and alteration of motion segment integrity, you need to have specific procedures uh, for both of those analyses. Okay? So that's a couple of examples as relate to the spine. What about uh, the upper extremities and the lower extremities? Well, again, when you have an examinee scheduled for uh, an evaluation next week, uh, you should know in advance uh, what's going on with that examinee. You should know the history of that case, you should know the body parts that are involved with that case, and you should get, start getting a sense uh, as to what you're going to be doing in this upcoming evaluation. And so let's say, for example, you have an upper extremity case coming up next week. You need to think in advance, what are the possible impairments that this person could present with, and how am I going to examine in my physical examination for the presence or absence of those permanent impairments. And this is going to be different uh, from the type of physical examination that you do in your clinical practice. And you, you might notice that if you read uh, doctor's reports, you'll notice that uh, there's sort of a disconnect or an incongruity uh, in the physical examination, uh, in the QME examination, because doctors are using examination maneuvers and procedures that really apply more to the clinical practice than to the uh, med legal practice where we're concerned with permanent impairments. So let's talk about some of the impairments uh, of the upper and lower extremities. Now the AMA guides tell us that upper extremity impairments <clears throat> are determined based on the presence or absence of amputations, presence or absence, uh, absence of digital nerve lesions, the presence or absence of abnormal motion, the presence or absence of a peripheral nerve disorder, or the presence or absence of a vascular disorder, uh, the presence or absence of a large group of what the AMA guides describe as other disorders, such as 
shoulder instability, carpal instability, uh, constrictive tenosynovitis of the hands and a variety of other conditions as well. And then finally, the AMA guides uh, describe permanent impairment of the upper, upper extremities based upon loss of strength of the upper extremity. Amputations, digital nerve lesions, abnormal motion, peripheral nerve disorders, vascular disorders, other disorders, and loss of strength. So let me just illustrate today's principle, which is to know the impairments and examine for them uh, by reviewing just a couple of these uh, different categories of permanent impairments. Now, at the maximum medical improvement date, if the examinee has a peripheral nerve disorder, that qualifies as a permanent impairment. So let me ask you, what is your physical examination procedures for the assessment of peripheral nerve disorders for the upper extremity? Let me ask you, what physical examination maneuvers do you use to assess for peripheral nerve disorder? Well, that would simply be our neurologic examination of the upper extremity, correct? and that would involve testing of reflexes, testing of motor strength, testing of sensation, uh, looking for the presence or absence of atrophy of muscles, and that's fairly straightforward, correct? The only thing that I want to point out to you with regards to the upper extremity peripheral nerves is that the examination procedures for the upper extremity peripheral nerves is different than the upper extremity examination that you would use for the assessment of radiculopathy of cervical spine nerve roots. And I found that uh, some doctors are not uh, aware of that distinction. And with upper extremity examination, doctors will report their findings related to uh, cervical spine nerve roots, which is incorrect. With the upper extremity, we're involved with peripheral nerves such as the axillary nerve, such as the median nerve, such as the radial nerve, such as the musculocutaneous nerve, such as the ulnar nerve. With our spinal exam, we're concerned with the nerve roots, C5, C6, C7, etc. But with the upper extremity, we specifically evaluate for function of the peripheral nerves. So that's a subtle distinction, and you need to know the specific functions uh, of the upper extremity peripheral nerves. You need to have a section in your upper extremity exam that deals with your evaluation of the peripheral nerves. Okay? And that's probably common sense, but I share that with you because uh, some doctors uh, are not aware of that distinction. Um, with regards to loss of strength, how do we assess the strength of the upper extremity? Well, the AMA guides describe the use of two methods. Uh, number one is the use of manual muscle testing, uh, and the second is the use of grip strength testing. Now, the AMA guides describe manual muscle testing uh, of the shoulder uh, and of the elbow, and this is uh, right out of section 16.8. So we do manual muscle testing on the shoulder and the elbow, and we assess for strength of the wrist and hand uh, through the use of grip strength testing. Now, let me ask you, uh, could we use manual muscle testing to assess for function of the wrist? The AMA guides don't describe manual muscle testing of the wrist in flexion, extension, radial abduction, and ulnar abduction. Uh, radial, adduction, uh, radial abduction and ulnar abduction, or radial deviation and ulnar deviation. The AMA guides don't describe that, but it's my opinion uh, that you could use manual muscle testing and you could analogize uh, to manual muscle testing of the wrist, even though it's not described in the AMA guides. And uh, I go over that uh, procedure in a separate upcoming video uh, relating to the physical examination for carpal tunnel syndrome and carpal instability. So, 
that talks a little bit about uh, loss of strength. Uh, with regards to other disorders, let's talk a little bit about carpal instability. Now, carpal instability is one of the permanent impairments of the upper extremity. It's described uh, in section 16.7 of the AMA guides. So let me ask you, what are your physical examination procedures that you use for the assessment of carpal instability? What is your carpal instability exam? Okay, you need to have a specific section in your examination that assesses for the presence or absence of carpal instability. So for carpal instability, there's a couple of physical examination procedures that we use, uh, such as the Watson test, such as the lunato triquetral ballotment test, such as the Shuck test, and these are physical examination maneuvers. And then also the AMA guides require, require that we order a specific set of x-rays on the wrist on which we perform measurements to assess for the presence or absence of carpal instability. And like the assessment for uh, motion segment integrity, I found that many doctors uh, do not order the necessary x-rays to assess for carpal instability and they simply overlook the carpal instability assessment. And the AMA guides require that we assess for the presence or absence of carpal instability in upper extremity cases that involve uh, the wrist and hand. And yet many doctors uh, don't do it because this is not something that they've yet integrated into their normal protocol because they don't do it in their clinical practice. And the point of today's material is that the examinations that maneuvers that we use in our QME practice are different from the ones that we use in our clinical practice. So uh, it's necessary and it's required that you order the, the uh, appropriate x-rays for the assessment of carpal instability. So you need to produce that uh, protocol and get that protocol integrated into your upper extremity examination. Okay? Well, what about the lower extremity? Well, the lower extremity really illustrates this principle because the AMA guides describe several physical examination findings uh, that qualify for permanent impairment that are different uh, from the physical examination findings that we're concerned with uh, in our clinical practice. So let me illustrate that uh, for you here. Uh, in chapter 17 of the AMA guides, which is the lower extremity chapter, uh, the, the guides describe three categories uh, of physical examination findings that qualify for permanent impairment. Category number one uh, are those physical examination findings that describe anatomic changes of the lower extremity. The second category are those physical examination findings that describe functional changes functional losses of the lower extremity. And then the third category are those physical examination findings that are associated uh, with diagnosis-based conditions. So let's illustrate this principle uh, briefly here. Some of the anatomic changes that are associated uh, with the lower extremity uh, would include arthritis of joints. Arthritis of joints. And this is described in Table 17, one of the AMA guides. So imagine this, you have an examinee who suffered a lower extremity injury and time has passed and because of the injury uh, the examinee has uh, developed arthritis of the involved joint, such as the hip joint, such as the knee joint, etc. Well, how do you assess the presence or absence of arthritis of the joints? Well, the AMA guides tell us that arthritis of the joints is assessed through x-ray measurements, through measurements of the cartilage intervals of the involved joint and comparing the cartilage intervals of the involved lower extremity with the uninvolved 
lower extremity. And yet I found that many doctors do not order the necessary x-rays because they simply have not integrated this into their normal protocol because it's not something that they would typically assess for in their clinical practice. And yet the AMA guides require it. So you need to have a formal section in your lower extremity examination to assess for arthritis of the joints. Now in the end of today's program I'm going to make this very simple for you because everything that I'm describing to you here today about knowing the impairments and examining for the impairments I've simplified for you by the by way of physical examination templates. I've organized all the physical examination maneuvers into their own unique sections uh, in the physical examination. So I want to offer you today, uh, for those of you that make it to the end of today's video, uh, absolutely free of charge, I want to offer you the lower extremity examination template that takes you through the physical examination procedures of the lower extremity step by step so that you leave no stone unturned uh, in the assessment of permanent impairments uh, of the lower extremity. And there's a complete section there uh, on the arthritis assessment. It gives you all the routine x-ray views uh, that the guides require that you obtain. Uh, describes all the normal cartilage intervals. Describes all the permanent impairments associated with reduced cartilage intervals. And it's all templated for you. You don't have to do anything. I've already done it for you, and I'm offering that to you at the end of today's video uh, as a free gift, and I'll give you a special code uh, that you can use to uh, download your lower extremity examination template. Okay, so make sure to stay with me uh, to the end of the video. <clears throat> the AMA guides uh, describe reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or CRIPS, chronic regional pain syndrome, CRIPS 1 and CRIPS 2 uh, as a permanent impairment. So what is your physical examination uh, for the assessment of CRIPS 1 or CRIPS 2? This is not something that we typically assess for in our clinical practice, but the guides require it. And so the, the uh, examination template that I want to offer you has a complete section uh, that you can refer to for the assessment of the presence or absence uh, of CRIPS 1 or CRIPS 2. Now, with regards to some of the functional changes that we assess for, uh, one of the functional changes uh, that the AMA guides describe as a permanent impairment includes uh, any derangement of gait as a result of a lower extremity uh, injury, gait derangement. And yet I found that many doctors do not have a formal gait analysis installed uh, into their physical examination procedures. Why don't they? Because it's not something that we typically do in our clinical practice. We don't take our uh, clinical patients outside of the uh, office and watch them walk and do a gait assessment, but the AMA guides, uh, they require that we do, that we do a formal gait analysis. And uh, many of the permanent impairments that are associated with gait derangement uh, require, require an actual observation uh, of the gait, and yet many doctors don't do it. So I provide for you in the lower extremity examination template a procedure that you can use uh, that's very easy to do, it's quick and easy, and it's fun to do actually, uh, and it provides you invaluable information uh, when it comes time to uh, provide for permanent impairment due to gait derangement. So this is an example where knowing the permanent impairments, knowing that a derangement of normal gait qualifies as permanent impairment, it gives us some guidance as to what we're uh, assessing for in our uh, physical examination. We need to have an actual assessment for gait derangement. So when you have a lower extremity case coming up on your calendar, you need to think about what are the possible permanent impairments that this person could present with. And you need to um, align your physical examination procedures for the assessment of those impairments, one of which uh, is gait derangement. 
okay. And then uh, some of the other uh, physical examination findings uh, that the AMA guys consider important with regards to uh, the lower extremity include uh, the presence or absence of permanent ligament injuries. So for example, ligament injuries around the knee, such as the medial or lateral collateral ligament, such as the anterior or posterior uh, cruciate ligaments. Uh, also, permanent ligament injury, injury around the ankle uh, with laxity of the ligaments around the ankle, that could qualify for permanent impairment. So what is your ligament injury exam or what is your physical examination protocol for the assessment uh, of ligamentous laxity of the knee, ligamentous laxity of the ankle. Uh, the assessment of ligamentous laxity of the ankle requires uh, uh, stress radiographs. And many doctors don't order stress radiographs. So you need to have this already installed in your physical examination so that you don't omit it from your protocol. See, ligamentous laxity of the ankle is one of the permanent impairments of the lower extremity which requires stress radiographs. You need to know that in advance and prepare to order or to prepare to obtain those stress radiographs before you even get to the physical examination with your injured worker. Okay? Uh, meniscectomies or permanent meniscus injury qualifies for permanent uh, impairment. So what is the physical examination protocol for the assessment uh, of the knee menisci. You need to have a meniscus assessment section in your physical examination template that simply guides you through the physical examination of the knee menisci. Okay? Uh, foot deformities, hip and pelvic bursitis uh, uh, at the maximum medical improvement date, they qualify for uh, permanent impairments. And so let me ask you, what are your physical examination procedures for the identification of the presence or absence of trochanteric bursitis? How would you identify trochanteric bursitis on physical exam? Or let me ask you this, what physical examination maneuvers would you specifically employ? And I said maneuvers, not just singular maneuver. What physical examination maneuvers would you employ or could you employ to specifically assess for trochanteric bursitis? I have this section for you in the lower extremity examination template. See, trochanteric bursitis is one of the permanent impairments of the lower extremity. And so knowing that, knowing that it's one of the permanent impairments, requires us to examine for it in our lower extremity examination cases. Okay, so let's conclude this section uh, with just a couple remarks. The topic that I'm sharing with you now uh, is a concept that's used by some of the very best evaluators uh, in the entire state of California. And the concept is that when you go into your physical examination with your next injured worker, you need to think in advance about what are the possible impairments uh, that this person could, could be left with. And then you need to examine for those impairments. Now this is different from going to the QME examination and simply doing a physical examination uh, similar to the physical examination you would use in your clinical practice and then deciding later in retrospect uh, which permanent impairments uh, uh, coincide with those physical examination findings. We want to put the horse before the cart and we want to consider what are the possible permanent impairments and then we want to assess those permanent impairments. So the topic is, the concept is to know the permanent impairments and then examine for them. So let me ask you, uh, what are some of the permanent impairments of the shoulder that you would assess for? What are the permanent impairments of the elbow that you would assess for? What are 
the permanent impairments of the knee that you would assess for. What are the permanent impairments uh, of the cervical spine that you would assess for? You need to know the permanent impairments and then examine specifically for those. Let's talk now about the actual physical examination maneuvers that we uh, use. And I want to share with you the idea that nothing demonstrates more to the examinee or to the reader of your report uh, your accuracy and your attention to detail and your thoroughness than exact measurements. Uh, on objective physical examination maneuvers. So I want to encourage you to never ever leave the physical examination with a single objective test undone and never ever attempt to fabricate uh, a finding on a physical examination test that you did not actually obtain uh, during the actual examination uh, of the injured worker. Uh, when you take your uh, objective measurements. Use exact numbers uh, and do not round off your numbers because uh, rounded off numbers, uh, you'll probably agree with me, are sometimes suspect, whereas exact numbers demonstrate to the reader uh, your precision in your measurement techniques. So it's much more convincing to produce a measurement reading of, for example, uh, 43 degrees than it is a measurement of 45 degrees. So use exact measurements uh, when you report your uh, objective measurements. So uh, let's talk about this a minute. What are some of the objective physical examination maneuvers uh, that we employ in our physical exam, right? Well, the objective maneuvers are those maneuvers that require a measurement, uh, or that require an instrument, okay? Objective maneuvers are those that require a measurement or some sort of physical examination instrument. And I want to encourage you to never leave a single objective test undone. Perform every single objective test. That's the topic uh, of today's discussion. So what are some of these objective physical examination maneuvers? Well, for example, range of motion maneuvers. Now, range of motion maneuvers uh, involve various different types of measuring instruments. For the spine, we use inclinometers. For the extremities, we use goniometers. Now, you should have in your doctor's bag uh, several different types of goniometers. You should have a long arm goniometer. You should have a short arm goniometer. Uh, you should have a baseline goniometer for measuring forearm pronation and supination. You should have finger 
goniometers. In other words, you should have the specific test instrument uh, for the range of motion that you're testing and perform every single range of motion uh, of the involved joint that is required by the AMA guides. Now, many of you uh, that do uh, thorough examinations, you've heard your examinees uh, state that, uh, wow, this is the most uh, e examination I've ever had. Uh, or the other doctor didn't do these examination maneuvers. You've probably heard that, right? Well, you don't want to be the doctor that the examinee refers to when they say that the other doctor didn't do those examination maneuvers. You want to be the doctor that they refer to when they say, well, that guy, he gave me the most thorough examination I ever had. And nothing impresses the examinee more than your attention to detail on the objective physical examination uh, maneuvers, such as range of motion testing. Uh, girth measurements uh, are another type of measurement that requires uh, an instrument. How do we uh, obtain girth measurements? Well, we use a tape measure. And when you perform your girth measurements, report your findings to exact increment. For example, down to the one-eighth of an inch uh, if your measuring tape provides uh, that depth of detail. Uh, you might even use centimeters for even greater uh, discrimination between differences in girth measurements. Uh, leg length measurements is an objective physical examination finding that we would use, uh, that we would assess with the use of a tape measure. Okay? Uh, chest expansion measurements is another physical examination, uh, object, objective physical examination uh, maneuver that we would use to assess for, uh, for example, thoracic spine function chest expansion measurements. Uh, straight leg raising is required uh, by the AMA guides in chapter 15 for the assessment of uh, radiculopathy and also for the assessment of lumbar spine range of motion validity. So how do you do straight leg raise testing? Well, you use your inclinometer to come up with exact measurements uh, on straight leg raise testing. Reflexes are an objective physical examination maneuver that requires a test instrument. Of course, we use the reflex hammer for that. So use your test instruments and your tape measures and your inclinometers and your goniometers and perform every single uh, objective test. Uh, sensory testing. Sensory testing involves many different types uh, of test instruments. Uh, we have our Sems Weinstein monofilaments. We have our uh, pinwheel with sharp and dull sides. Uh, we have our two point discriminator for two point discrimination testing. So these are physical examination maneuvers uh, that are precise and that require uh, delicate and calibrated instruments. And these are physical examination maneuvers that require a very precise. Uh, finding. And so rep report your findings with precise and exact increments. Uh, for example, two point discrimination testing is reported in millimeters. SEMS Weinstein monofilament testing is reported in the gauge of the monofilament 2.83 monofilaments, 3.61 monofilaments, etc. So report your findings using exact objective numbers. Tennell's test is a, an objective uh, physical examination maneuver that requires a test instrument. What are some other ones? Uh, grip strength testing, pinch strength testing uh, requires a test instrument. Auscultation through the stethoscope, percussion uh, of the chest and abdomen. Uh, what about your cranial nerve exam in those cases that involve a central nervous system uh, injury or head injury? Uh, what about, what are some of the objective tests that we use for the assessment of the cranial nerves? Well, how about testing cranial nerve number one for olfaction? That requires that we have uh, some substance that the examinee can attempt to smell, whether it be coffee or peppermint or mint. You need to have these in your doctor's bag because these are objective tests 
that will impress the examinee and that will impress the reader of your report and contribute to the persuasiveness of your final report. And that's the whole concept of this program, the 21 secrets of the most persuasive QMEs, one of which is to perform every single objective test and to report your findings with precise incremental uh, measurements. Vision requires that we use a Snellen eye chart. Uh, taste over the anterior two-thirds of the tum tongue for the assessment uh, of cranial nerve number seven requires that we use a test substance such as uh, uh, salt, salt or, or such as sugar or some substance to uh, stimulate the taste buds over the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Uh, testing for cranial nerve number eight, the uh, cochlear nerve, uh, requires that we use tuning forks, correct? A, an objective test instrument. So the concept is to perform every single objective test and use every single test instrument uh, in your doctor's bag. It's very impressive uh, to the examinee and also contributes to uh, the persuasiveness uh, of your final report. So finally, uh, and just a word of caution, uh, do not leave the examination uh, with any undone tests and never ever try to fabricate or recreate uh, physical examination maneuvers that you didn't actually perform. And I wonder if you've ever had an examinee say to you uh, that they read a report of their own physical examination and uh, According to them, the doctor never even performed that test. Uh, I've had examinees tell me that the doctor didn't test their reflexes. How would they know that? Well, they know that the doctor never brought out the reflex hammer. Or they'll tell you that uh, the doctor didn't do range of motion testing. How would they tell you that? Well, when you're doing your range of motion testing, specifically with inclinometers, uh, you could ask the examinee, well, did the doctor have these inclinometers? Did the doctor do these tests? And the examinees many times will tell me uh, that, no, he, he, didn't, he didn't do those tests. So never ever try to fabricate uh, a physical examination finding or a physical examination maneuver that you did not actually perform uh, because the examinees, trust me, the examinees, they know which physical examination maneuvers you did and which ones you didn't do. And you want the examinee to be impressed and amazed uh, with all of the procedures uh, that you actually did. Let's summarize these two principles and bring this uh, video program uh, to a conclusion. This uh, material that I'm sharing with you today is extracted from the six-hour continuing education home study program entitled The 21 Secrets of the Most Persuasive QMEs. And I should say that the very best QMEs are persuasive because of the quality work that they do. 
So I share some of this, their secrets and procedures and basically their best practices uh, that the very best qualified medical evaluators use in the evaluation of injured workers. And one of the procedures that the qualified medical evaluators rely upon uh, is to know in advance uh, what it is they're doing with each particular examinee. So when the uh, evaluator has a spine case coming up, uh, they know in advance what they're going to be examining for. Uh, if, you have, if they have a lower extremity case coming up, they know in advance uh, what types of physical examination maneuvers they're going to be doing because they know the impairments. They know Chapter 17 inside and out, and they know what the AMA guides consider to be uh, demonstrative physical examination findings for loss, loss of use, or derangement of function uh, of the lower extremities. So I encourage you to become familiar with the impairments as they're described in chapters 15, uh, 16, chapter 17, chapter 13 if you're uh, involved in uh, examining neurology-based cases. And so you need to know the impairments in advance so that your physical examination is oriented around examining for the uh, permanent impairments as those are described in the AMA guides. And then the very best evaluators are meticulous uh, in the physical examination. They're mavericks uh, on the physical examination. And so I want to encourage you to uh, highlight and uh, uh, that's what the very best evaluators do is they highlight the sections of the physical examination that require objective uh, measurements or use of test, inst test instruments and they make sure that they leave no highlighted area undone when they leave the physical examination. So the two concepts I shared with you today are number one, know the impairments and examine for the impairments. And then number two, uh, perform every single objective physical examination maneuver. So uh, I believe that if you implement these two procedures into your very next evaluation, it will infinitely uh, increase the quality of your examination. This will impress uh, your examinee and this will impress the parties as to your thoroughness, your attention to detail, uh, and will draw attention to the quality of your work uh, and will contribute to the persuasiveness of the conclusions and opinions that you offer uh, in your QME report. And that's what we're all after, is uh, increasing and expanding our reputation as quality uh, and persuasive qualified medical evaluators. So doctors, uh, for those of you that have now made it to the end of this video, I have a special gift for you. And as I promised you earlier, uh, I have available for you a lower extremity examination template. And this template is over 20 pages long and includes every single physical examination procedure for the assessment of anatomic impairments, functional impairments, and diagnosis-based uh, impairments, exactly as those are described in the AMA guides. And this template has been several years in the making and it's now in its final uh, perfect form, uh, at least as it has evolved up until this point in time. So I want to make that available for you and I provide for you right here a link that you can type into uh, your browser, uh, your internet browser, and it will take you right to a landing page on my website where you can request a free digital download of this uh, lower extremity examination template. And this uh, template will infinitely streamline uh, and organize your physical examination procedure. So doctors, I hope this material helps you and I hope you uh, take advantage of our free offer for the lower extremity examination template. This is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I look forward to being with you on future videos. And for now, I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.